the course itself is defending the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So there's an underlying assumption that number one, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi needs defense. Are we, first off, capable of defending someone of the stature of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? What does that even mean, right? So that's a, that's a question I'm proposing to you guys to think about and ponder. Number two, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the person that we should love more than ourselves, our parents, our children, right? Um, and he has such a special place, that place of veneration and everything. What does that mean to us? What does that mean for you know our course? Obviously, it's it's this is why we're taking a course like this. But then how does that translate into our daily lives, right? How does that translate into us being Muslim? And then how does that translate into our da'wah? That's also a big question that we're going to be kind of discussing over the course of the semester, inshallah ta'ala. Now, it also means, now from a practical point of view, why is this course taking place? Well, because modern enemies of Islam and even some... People that are not necessarily showing animosity, meaning they're not necessarily enemies of Islam, have taken the person of the Prophet ﷺ because of how important he is to us. So we, we readily acknowledge he's, he's very important to us. And them knowing this will attack him personally and use that as a tool to disprove Islam or to at least make you shameful or make you feel shameful um, because there's no shame in following the Prophet or in acknowledging his his <laughs> prophethood, right? Um, but they want to make you feel that way that there's something inherently wrong with the religion if they can find something wrong or morally wrong with the Prophet or with some things that he is on record doing, right? Um, so that's that's kind of why this course was born and this need was born. Because there are many attacks against the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And in fact, almost not every day, but every, you know, so often there's a new attack. Some Islamophobe, some, you know, hater um, finds a new way to attack the religion via attacking the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So for this class... I'm going to be focusing on overall strategies, not specific attacks necessarily. We will go over specific attacks, but I'll tell you how. But we're going to be going over overall strategies in dealing with these attacks. Because the reality is, you can memorize what to say when a person brings up the age of Aisha, for example, when it comes to the marriage of the Prophet Sassan to Aisha. You can memorize a really good answer. And Whenever somebody asks you, you just become a tape recorder and you just play back the, the answer that you've memorized. That's one strategy, right? There are deficiencies with that strategy, though. That strategy sometimes doesn't work. The person might not be interested in your recording. Plus, the person might realize they're just reciting something that you've memorized and you're not engaging with them on a level that they understand. You're not actually answering their contention. Um which is why I don't like, personally, I don't like the pre-recorded, memorized answers. So we're not going to be doing that in this course. So if you're here, <laughs> if you're here to memorize pre-recorded answers to common, to common um, objections or common things that people bring up, this is not the course for you. Um, in this course, we will be giving you strategies um, to handle any question that you're given, right? They could ask you any question, even if in fact it could be a question that you've never heard before and you're still capable of answering the person. That's the idea. So I want, uh, so it's more of a, like high level strategies, more so than specific things. Now, obviously there are specific things that will come up and we can talk of them, you know, we can, um, we can talk to them, you know, we can, we can bring things up, but it's not going to be, um, I don't want people to be pre-recorded, you know what I mean, just uh, everything. So so the first question that I mentioned was like um, about the age of Aisha عنها, when the Prophet Sallallahu married her, right? We know the hadith in Bukhari, it's an athar um, that mentions that the Prophet Sallallahu uh, 
first got engaged to her, you know, at the age of six, and he consummated the marriage at the age of nine. And for us in modern times, we hear like, whoa, she was nine years old. Like, how how could that be a possible? Like, how how could somebody like the Prophet do this? You know, is he, you know, why is he marrying a child? What's going on? All these things. It causes a lot of doubts. In fact, it sometimes can cause problems with Muslims, born Muslims. And it causes a lot of problems for people that are interested in Islam. They research it, you talk to them. So that we're talking about overall strategies, right? And how to deal with a difficult question specifically about the Prophet ﷺ. When it comes to these types of questions, remember, and we're going to be going over this inshallah as you know in the next few weeks. Another one, another you know, issue is we have to evaluate who is asking this question, right? Is this a person who knows anything about Aisha other than her age. <laughs> Meaning, for this type of person, he's actually less interested in who Aisha is, who the Prophet ﷺ is, and more interested in maybe disproving Islam itself. Which means if we focus on the question, if we focus on the issue of the age of Aisha, we're actually ignoring what the person really is asking. Right? Now, there could be a genuine person asking, it could be a malicious person asking, it could be a person who read, researched online, and it's coming and it's like, okay, the first Muslim that I meet, I'm going to ask him this question. I'm going to put him on the spot. And I'm going to show him why his religion is false. And he comes and he's very antagonistic. The way that we deal with that type of person is very different than how we deal with a sincere person who read something, he's doing research and he reads it online. And he's like, hey, you know, you're my Muslim friend. I read this online. Like, tell me, explain this to me. Like, how does this, how does this work? What's, what's up with this? Why would your prophet do this? And he's genuine, right? He's curious. There's a way to deal with that person as well. And you can lead them on. You tell them, obviously, I'm getting ahead of myself. But you, you, we put the question to the side first. And we tell them, what is Islam? Because if they don't know what Islam is, it's kind of useless for us to get into the weeds and the details of an answer like this. Right? We don't need it. Um, so we have to, so like I said, we're going to be focusing on overall strategies, inshallah ta'ala, high level stuff in order to answer these types of difficult questions. And part of it is identifying who's asking, why are they asking, why are they interested, how much do they know about Islam, if any. And if they don't know anything about Islam, then our first step is actually telling them a little bit about Islam, not diving headfirst into answering the age of Aisha or anything else like this. One of the pitfalls of doing that type of strategy is that you end up playing a game of whack-a-mole. I, I don't know if anybody's familiar with the game of whack-a-mole. Whack-a-mole was like an old arcade game. that I'm dating myself here. That, that's how old I am. Where like whack-a-moles, moles would come out of like a little game and you hit them, you know, with a hammer. One pops up over here, you hit it. One pops up over here, you hit it. And just keep on going. Like you, you can't end, right? It's never ending. And so we can't do that. Like if you, if you deal with issues that come up, wallah, they'll come up with random stuff. And you're like, why is this even an issue? And so for us, if you deal with the underlying um, problem at hand, you save yourself from the whole game of whack-a-mole, right? It's similar to the strategy that Umar anhu was asking uh, uh, one of the other companions, I believe, came to Umar and said, Ya Umar, I have a problem. You know, shaitan just comes, keeps on coming and whispering to me and I, and I can't stop it. I keep on listening to shaitan. And, you know, I just can't, it's a never ending process. Shaitan comes to me from the right, from the left, from here, from there. And I just, I keep on falling a victim. And it says, that's because you're dealing with a dog and you are not capable of dealing with a dog um, that is going to keep on coming out you. So if you were out in the wilderness and a dog comes at you, right? What do you do? What do you do with the dog? He says, if you keep on just shooing the dog away, the dog will come back. You shoo the dog away, the dog comes back. He says, instead, you should deal with the owner of the dog. If you tell the owner, hey, hold your dog back, that's it. I don't have to deal with the dog anymore because I let the owner deal with him, right? And he says, such a strategy with shaitan is that you shouldn't take on shaitan directly yourself. You should instead ask Allah to help with shaitan, which is the meaning of the word, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem. I seek refuge in Allah. From shaitan the accursed. Because when Allah helps you, that's it, shaitan is gone. But if I think that I can I can deal with shaitan myself and see his plans and his plots and his traps that he's putting for me, 
uh, you're going to lose. <laughs> and it's going to be a, t- you're going to, it's a never ending game, right? It's like black mole It's just going to keep on coming at you. Where instead, if you put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah is going to suffice me, Allah is going to protect me, I'm doing my adhkar, I'm, you know, safeguarding my salah, all my five daily prayers, I'm doing my adhkar in the morning, in the evening, I'm protecting myself. It's peace of mind. I don't have to deal with shaitan anymore. Right? And that's the idea. So with this, with the attacks on the Prophet wasallam, when we deal with the person at a high level, um, it ends up being much, much better. Right? And I'll tell you guys, like, um, I had a guy, he came to the masjid. Um, I am so he emailed the masjid and he said, I need, I have, I have some questions. I need somebody to answer them about Islam, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So I said, Yeah, brother, come, come to the masjid. Um, let's find a day and time when, when that's appropriate for you. And he said, No, I don't feel safe coming to the mosque. Um, we can meet at like a coffee shop. And then he says, I don't like Starbucks. I said, Excellent, very good. We're boycotting, anyways. <laughs> Not a problem. Um, so we went to a local coffee shop. I went and sat down with him, met with him. He had printed off of the internet, right? I think it was like a sheet that says the top 10 most difficult questions to ask a Muslim. That's literally what he printed off. And it brings him and he's like, okay, are you ready? I'm going to, I'm going to go down this list. I look at the list and I'm like, oh my gosh. Okay, sure. Go ahead. So the question number one, right? Why does Islam kill apostates? I'm like, oh man. We it took us about an hour discussing that question, right? In reality, we never answered the question. What I ended up doing is asking him about how much he knows about Islam, and then going from there. And it turns out he did it, he knew a little bit, just enough to kind of be interested in it and stuff. Um so then you know we we finished after an hour. He's like, okay, thank you for your time. I have to go now, but can we meet again next week? I said, absolutely. We come back next week, same time, same place. And he's like, I think we're on question number two. I'm like, yeah, let's go. Question number two is about slavery and Islam, right? Another difficult question. And again, we didn't actually, like we discussed, I started asking questions, his family background, all these other things. Um, we never actually answered the specific question. Meeting number three, he took a shahada, alhamdulillah. And we never answered any of the ten questions. Like, not a single question was answered. Why? Because we we dealt with it in a way where we're talking to the person. Tell me, why are you asking these questions? Like, what do you want? Essentially, that's what, that's what the essence of the conversation was. Like, what are you interested in? Like, all these difficult... Like, it's not just that they're difficult. There are questions that are unnecessary for the average individual because they don't even know what's going on. You don't even have the prerequisites to discuss such a question. It's like a person asking a question about like um, rocket science and they've never taken a single class in basic physics, right? You can't, it's, you're, what are you talking about? And then they'll come and they'll still argue, right? Um, so anyways, that's, a, that's another topic, Annie. We have to, we have to kind of humble ourselves and we also have to realize that the person that we're talking to also has to be humble um, in this regard, inshallah ta'ala. So, that's a little bit about what we're going to be doing in the class. So um, in terms of schedule, a schedule, I'll post this, inshallah ta'ala, just a basic schedule onto the, uh, the, the Moodle Hub. Um, so next week, we're going to be going over the Gore app, which is a basic roadmap for giving da'wah, and we'll tailor it for specifically the seerah. Week number three is how do we prove that the intellectually, so how do we make a rational, logical case that the Prophet Sallallahu is in fact a Prophet without using anything else, so without using the Qur'an, without using anything else, can we make the case that the Prophet Sallallahu is in fact a Prophet? And then second part of that is, what does that actually mean? So when a person says, yes, I believe he's a Prophet, what does that mean? Week number four, we're going to be talking about the Seerah and the Sunnah and how do we read both? How do we derive stuff from them? Um, week number five is specifically strategies in handling difficult questions. Week number six are some of the contentions, and we'll get into the weeds a little bit. And then the the next few weeks, we'll be discussing your guys' research. So the what I want from you guys in this class is the following. Okay, there's about 20 students in here, and I'm going to post this assignment, inshallah ta'ala, on the Moodle Hub as well. But the basic idea is in the next week, 
I want you all to research or to, to I'm sorry, not research, but to at least look up potential topics to research. Okay, so I'm not going to give you guys a final. Um, I don't think a final would work for a class like this anyways. What I do want is for you all to do research. And I'm not strict in terms of length. I'm not strict in terms of even format or anything else, right? What I want you to do is the research and where you pick a topic that you know that this is a contentious topic. So like, for example, I already handed out, like I already spoke about the issue of the age of Aisha, anha, right? And the marriage of the Prophet to Aisha. That is a potential topic because it deals with the Prophet directly. So any topic like that could be the Prophet's marriage to Zainab. It could be his marriage to um, Sophia. It could be any one of his marriages in reality, <laughs> right? Any one of those is controversial and it's it's had controversy from a long time ago. There's plenty of topics from the seerah. Anybody who's taken the seerah or has taken a class on the seerah, read a book on the seerah, knows these. And we'll get, we're going to get into, like I said, we have a whole week dedicated to the seerah and the book, the different books and how to read the seerah and whatnot. Um, but any one of those. So I want you for the next week to look up potential topics for you to research and then make a decision. Okay, this is what I want to research for the rest of the semester. Because the last two weeks of the class... I'm going to be dedicating to you, the students, to present your research. So not only will you submit it for me to class for to grade, but I want you to actually to present it to your peers so that they can benefit from what you've researched. And there's a dual benefit in this is that it also helps you present your findings so that when you meet a non-Muslim, maybe they have some of those contentions. Remember, we have the overall strategies, but then you can get into the specifics if you find it appropriate or necessary. Because sometimes it is appropriate to get into the weeds with the person who's willing to do that with you. Sometimes it's not. And so that's something that we can do together, inshallah ta'ala. But the overall idea is that for the next week or so, I want you to think of a potential controversy or some attack angle that people use to attack. Like there's one that's absolutely ridiculous that was um, pushed by, um, oh, I forgot the name of that Islamophobe where he basically wrote a whole book and he's questioning whether Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu even existed or not. This is such an old idea, by the way, that was promoted by an old Orientalist like a hundred years ago, who he theorized, of course he knows that he existed, but that guy was saying it could potentially be theorized that the Prophet's persona was invented by the Umayyad Empire. Like, it's literally the case. So this guy jumps on um, that idea and then um, you know goes at it so anyways like did he even exist that's maybe a potential topic to disprove obviously it doesn't need disproving but it's so ridiculous that there are people who might believe that so yes do we need to confirm the topics yes so what's going to happen is I'm going to post I'm going to have a place on the Moodle hub so this is the place where you log in for the classes the Moodle hub I think it's Moodle cloud now and um, you go on there and I'll have the place where you can submit the topic that you want. And yes, I would like it if there are um, a diversity in the topics. So we're going to make public the topics that people choose. Um, I don't mind some overlap if people really want that. Although a diversity in topics will be good. So I'm not going to be strict in, in terms of that. You know what I mean? Okay. So any questions right now?